His is on. Yeah, it's on the screen now. Mine's yeah. on now. Is he's on. Yeah. yeah. On. Um, so he was, he's been involved. Uh, so there's a history to all this deep learning stuff that goes back to this CIFAR organization, the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research. And Nando's been a CIFAR fellow for a number of years going to these meetings where uh, a lot of the ideas were laid down that have now become very successful. And I think partially as a result of that, I'm assuming, I'm inferring. Um, Nando also got very interested early on in the days of Bayesian optimization. There's been some major contributions there. And also, most recently, he moved across to Oxford. And after about three weeks in Oxford, he formed a company that did some amazing stuff, which was bought by DeepMind. So um, he works 50% uh, of the time at DeepMind now, is that right? Uh, it's 90. 90%. <laughs> <laughs> If you're Bayesian, you realize there's not much difference between 50 and 90%. It's when you start getting at 99.99%, you have to start worrying about 50, 90, that's fine, it's prior, it'll work, the data will take over. 90% um, at uh, DeepMind. Still, you, you spend, I thought you spend a day a week in Oxford, but is it one every two? More or less, yeah. Um, down in London, so he's really at the heart of this revolution. So it's great to have him here to talk a little bit about... Um, Bayesian optimization side, which is sort of an important part of that revolution, and uh, we've already heard Javier talk about earlier, it's sort of got the Gaussian process at its core. So, Thank you so much, Neil. That was a very kind introduction. Um, yeah, unlike Neil, I've always been more of a, a refugee, a migrant. <laughs> so I kept jumping topics and universities and traveling, uh, while Neil just became the guru of Gaussian processes here, and then then pretty well. It's, uh, it's quite an, uh, it's quite amazing what you've achieved. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here. So you've uh, probably been hearing a lot about Gaussian processes uh, this week. And I'm going to be talking about Bayesian optimization. Um, you had a first tutorial this morning, which was uh, more um, a GP, Bayesian optimization with Gaussian processes. So I'm going to veer a bit more toward Bayesian optimization, where Gaussian processes are just going to be one of many models you could use. Um, but you'll see that these other models that I'm going to talk about are actually related to Gaussian processes too. But I think by escaping the, the mold, um, you can see a lot of other ideas that you could use to um, do research in this area. Um, if you want to look at the GP way of doing things, like when um, I think in around 2008 or so when I started working, this 2007 I started working this in Bayesian optimization of Gaussian processes. Actually six, except that all the papers kept getting rejected for like three years <laughs> and, and, until people realized that, oh, this is not active learning. <laughs> um, and eventually, um, we wrote a long tutorial, which we put on the web, and uh, mainly because it kept getting rejected. And I, I love looking at the citation count for it. It's, I'll never publish it. But it has a good um, account of how to do Gaussian processes with Bayesian optimization. And especially Eric Brochu, one, one of my PhD students who's responsible for this, um, he went on and did an extensive literature review um, there uh, and I think that literature review helped a lot of people because all of a sudden you could see a, a lot of people could also go back to the old uh, papers and realize that um, Bayesian optimization actually has been happening for a long, long time and it has been the focus of, of attention by many um, statisticians, by many geophysicists, by um, all sorts of people have worked on this. More recently, what's happened is that computer scientists, it's just, just like the rest of statistics, computer scientists started doing a lot of this stuff. And so they've merged um, the statistical methodology with, com with computing. And with increased computational resources and with all sorts of smart um, algorithms and data structures, uh, we've kind of now moved into like a very, very exciting time uh, for, for Bayesian optimization. Um, and it's a good time to, like if you guys are looking for topics, it's not a bad time to get into it because it's still pretty much a nascent field within machine learning. Um, it's still relatively small um, and there's lots of open problems. We, it's by no means a small problem. It's really a vast set of problems. And, and I think that's the first thing to, to understand. Quite often I hear people coming in to this field and saying, I have a better way of doing it. You guys are all doing heuristics. This is the right way of doing it. 
Um, if you hear that, uh, be sure that it's rubbish, uh, because it's like there's no free lunch in this. Uh, we're trying to solve problems for which of which we do have to introduce heuristics, or as other people call them, priors. Uh, most of what I'm going to talk about today is about something I just uploaded last week to my website. Um, it's uh, the, the 2015 tutorial um, on Bayesian optimization, which uh, um, I wrote with a bunch of colleagues. Um, spe uh, s essentially, it was like the group of Ryan items in my group got together and we decided to write uh, a new tutorial. Um, I encourage you to read it because we'll have a lot more detail. Uh, my talk will be based on this. And in particular, if you see that there's missing references, this hasn't gone to print, uh, please email me uh, or type us or whatever, and we'll take care of that. OK, so this is uh, what I plan as the outline for my talk today and my talk tomorrow. Um, how many of you will stay for tomorrow? OK, good. I was worried about that. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go up to here, I think, today, up to acquisition functions, which is going to be sort of mirror what we did this morning. And then I'm going to talk about all sorts of open problems in Bayesian optimization. And as you can see, um, each of these areas is actually extremely hard uh, to crack. Um, it's not just one problem of Bayesian optimization, but it's, it's really a lot of uh, problems. I mean, one of the things I tend to do a lot now at Google DeepMind is launch a neural network to solve some task. Um, in the software, I sort of have to specify a bunch of flags about the optimizer. I have to specify many flags about um, parameters of like layers and all sorts of things. Um, parameters as to how I'm going to do this computation in the distributed Borg, uh, in the Google Borg. Um, and so very quickly, I, I have this sort of really complex uh, 20 uh, to 40 parameters uh, that I need to come up with good values for. And they interact in very complex ways. Some are discrete, some are continuous, some depend on the others, like you only need to tune the number of neurons in a layer, provided that that layer exists, uh, for example. And to this day, we don't have a single method that can do that. Uh, we're still relying, I think every company is still relying on humans to do it properly. And even though the field has progressed a lot and we've made a lot of progress, and Ryan Adams has written papers and software, and uh, Frank Hunt has done uh, amazing stuff, and, and a lot of people really have worked on this and done, uh, made a lot of progress. Um, the, the truth is uh, we do not have yet a solution. Um, and the solution is not going to be just be based on uh, someone coming up and saying, this is the, I mean, I, I could ob obviously always be wrong with this. But I really strongly doubt there will be one person who will say, this is the, the right way to do it. Um, as some people are still blogging about these days. Um, but it's really, it will require really attention to all sorts of, to many, many problems, which I will try to outline over the next few days. Um, OK, so the, in abstract, the problem is one of doing optimization when you can query a function, but, uh, and that's all you can do. Um, you, might want, you might query the derivative as well, and in which case you can also use the derivative. So, um, but in, in sort of an abstract, you get the function, and this function is corrupted by noise. So what you get to observe is some uh, observation y of the cost function, and um, you're trying to estimate um, this mean. Um, in particular, you're trying to estimate the peak of that mean function. So you observe there's a function with lots of noise, and your objective is to find the optimum of that function despite the noise. And all you get to do is query the function. So a common example is if I want to know what you guys want whether you guys prefer a beer or wine, the only way I can find out is by querying you, by asking you a question. Um, and sometimes it's not just a binary decision, but I might want to establish exactly where your preference lies with regards to beer 
And that might involve multiple questions. Um, and there's no way of me having this mathematical model of how much you like beer and then computing derivatives and optimizing, but rather I will have to rely on sampling. Um, so to, to go over what we did this morning, um, the setup is as follows. Uh, we're going to assume that there's some true function that you want to optimize. In this case, we want to find the maximum. Um, and that function is this dashed um, function here. Of course, I don't know this function. I'm just drawing it here. But all I will know is if I have already sampled at the two points, that is, I picked two x values, I was able to measure these y values. So I have observations, but I don't know um, the rest of the function. But if I do have these two observations, I can already fit a Gaussian process, so a mean and a covariance, um, to this. And I can obtain um, an estimate of what I believe that cost function is. And, and that's why we're basing. Because essentially, you don't know what the, you, there's a cost function you have to optimize, but you don't know what that cost function is. So we put a prior on it, in this case, a Gaussian process prior. So we basically say this function has a certain degree of smoothness and continuity. And then we exploit that uh, combined with obser observations by a base rule to, do, to choose the next point. And choosing the next point is done via maximum expected utility. Um, maximum expected utility, in general, is intractable. So what we're going to do is we're going to int introduce many heuristics. And these are the, the acquisition functions that you saw this morning, like expected improvement, UCB, entropy search, and so on. Um, let's assume that the, the green thing is the acquisition function. So provided we can optimize the um, acquisition function, um, provided that that's the case, um, you find uh, the optimum of the green line. And given that, gr um, so the peak, and given um, that peak, you would sample the function there. Now the idea is that this acquisition function We'll use the statistics of the Gaussian process, like the mean and the variance. For example, the UCB, which is be the mean plus some um, parameter, depending on time, times the variance. Um, and, and that is actually something for which we have a mathematical expression. So you can la launch uh, an optimizer. And there's many optimizers you could use uh, for that. And uh, there's a whole bag of tricks that folks use to do that. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on some of those. I don't know if you guys covered them this morning. Did you talk about optimizers of the expected improvement? Um, so of, typically what folks do is a mix. I don't have it in my slides as well. But um, it's Latin hypercubes. Um, people do, there's a black box optimizers like direct, CMA, yes. Um, some people pick a point in a grid and then follow gradients for a bit. Um, and uh, a lot of software actually uses that trick. Um, but the hope is that even if you don't find that optimizer at that, I that iteration, because we're doing sequential design and we're going to do this over several iterations, if you didn't pick the right optimum at one iteration, um, like assuming that that was not the right one, but the right one was the guy here on the right, um, by picking this point, you've lowered this curve a lot. So now your chances of picking this other point sort of increase. So the method is somewhat robust to using the wrong optimizer. And that's basically it. So it's an extremely simple idea. Uh, all you need is an acquisition function that you optimize to decide which point to query next. Um, and then you augment the data set with the new input and output points. And then you update the statistical model. So you, the two equations of the GP that you've seen, um, they go here. You update the mean, you update the, the covariance. And then this alpha would be, say, the mean plus the covariance. And you optimize that. And that's basically Bayesian optimization in a nutshell. Um, I want to make this interactive, given that it's a summer school. So uh, if, if um, if you have any questions, just uh, stop me and ask, please.
Mm-hmm. Thanks. Uh, good question. Um, you can go point by point. So tomorrow I'm going to talk a bit about that. Um, some folks try to do it in batches and also try to do this sort of in parallel to, to sort of do computation more efficiently. Um, in all that I'm going to talk about today, the assumption is we're doing this sequentially, point by point. So a, sort of an example would be you're drilling, you're drilling for oil and you might want to complete that $1 million uh, whatever drill before you move on to the next. Wouldn't you consider an initial sampling plan as part of Bayesian optimization framework? The initial sampling? An initial sampling plan, because, for example, when optimizing a 10-dimensional problem, you probably wouldn't want to create a Gaussian process from just two points. Oh, th that's correct. So, so often people bootstrap by, say, picking the Latin hypercube and picking a few points. And you do have to do that. That's a very good question. In low dimensions, everything looks easy. <laughs> in, high, in high dimensions, uh, fitting functions in very high dimensions is, uh, is a tricky business, especially when you, you have very few points. Um, so what really matters is which prior assumptions you bring in. Because if you don't have the data, the only thing left in your hand is whatever knowledge you have about the problem. All right, so I'm going to go quickly over applications. So one of the most popular ones, especially with the software experiment um, out there, is you have a bunch of uh, models a bunch of machine learning techniques and so on and it's possible to automatically search so suppose you have a classification problem um, it's, pos it's possible to automatically pick the classifier and the hyperparameters of the classifier to get the best performance and th there's a few papers out there to do this uh, Frank Hatter has a few papers he has a thing called Otto Wecker for Wecker um, I think a few people um, Matt Hoffman who will be here tomorrow um, as well as, also Frank has another paper, he also does automatic scikit-learn. Um, I would love it if one of you did automatic torch. Uh, for, uh, it's a package for neural networks. We really need an automatic ver variant of that. Um, so automatic machine learning was sort of being one of the driving forces, the idea of tuning hyperparameters. Um, I, I think it was only when um, the paper of Jasper Snook came out with uh, that people actually sort of took notice of this in machine learning. Um, even though we had been doing this for years, um, I don't think that the impact was as vast as when people realized, oh, I can tune my hyperparameters. Um, but there's many other things you can, I mean, you can tune machine learning techniques. You can tune um, information extracting, uh, um, you know, all sorts of algorithms that people out there use. So like one of the examples that one of my students tried was um, uh, Hector Garcia Molina had this paper on um, going to reviews and, and from a review being able to extract groups of words that should go together. So that turns out to be actually really important because if you're trying to, for example, decide um, whether the, the confit, the canard in, um, in a particular restaurant is good, it's important that you understand that that whole red thing is one term as opposed to three separate words. I mean, it's kind of, this might sound kind of silly. For humans, it's obvious, but for machines, it's not obvious. And so deciding which, how to group words to create concepts or to create things that we tend to understand as one thing um, is actually hard. And people come up with these sort of uh, rules of thumb, um, and they create a bunch, like lots of if-then rules, and very complex systems, and then they tune them by hand until they get the right uh, performance. Um, and so, in all these sort of information extraction pipelines, it's one could treat them as Bayesian optimization, and you could actually automate the process of tuning. Uh, the information extraction architectures. And when you do that, you get improved performance. Uh, you do better than the PhD students of Hector Garcia Molina who tuned it by hand. Um, here's an experience close to heart. So when I was doing my PhD with um, 
I should, uh, Neil's wife was <laughs> sitting next to me <laughs> throughout my PhD. Um, that's how I got to know Neil. <laughs> um, there were, uh, I was looking at Bayesian methods for neural networks um, and there were a few papers out there doing this that started with David Mackay in 92 using the evidence maximization and there was a particular data set that he liked this robot arm data um, the days in which the data sets were like a hundred points <laughs> two dimensional um, and his error was 0 0.0573 and then Radford Neal came with Hyper Monte Carlo and he knocked down the error and then there was a big fuss about ARD which you probably remember from the Newton Institute look how much it reduced the error um, <laughs> and then other people tried other models uh, like Peter Muller with uh, his reversible jump stuff um, and using uninformative priors a, a lot of statistical modeling. These were heavy papers in statistics going to JASA. Um, I remember spending years trying to understand them. Um, and toward the end of my PhD, after three years of trying really hard, um, I achieved this performance and I was pretty pleased. It probably was overfitting like hell, the data at that <laughs> age. Um, and then a student of mine, uh, T.U., came in and he took a uh, Neil sampler, the vanilla one, and just put a Bayesian optimization to tune the two hyperparameters and run it. And let Bayesian optimization tune the hyperparameters and he gets this result. Um, so the lesson here being that sometimes we're comparing techniques and it's the real these differences don't really exist. It's down to the hyperparameter choices. Um, and tuning those hyperparameters does prove to be quite uh, sometimes more decisive than um, a JASA paper. Um, and to kind of hammer this even more, we also took, uh, he also took a technique that for that um, someone very smart, Andrew Goldman, engineer to do adaptive hybrid Monte Carlo called NUTS. And this, again, another paper, um, and it involves sort of very fancy techniques. And he just compared it against just HMC with a Bayesian optimization with a GP, um, and he outperformed it um, in all the tasks. And then if you add um, higher order, uh, moments uh, to get the Riemannian manifold Monte Carlo, you can still use uh, the method. Um, what also, uh, what this type of thinking also allows one to do is that um, often we tend to pick algorithms that are simple just because there are few parameters. Keep sampling, SGD, they're beautiful algorithms because um, they're easy to code, there's very, very few parameters. Uh, you don't need to be thinking about how to tune different things. Um, but we know they don't do well, and so someone, like every couple of seconds these days, invents a new algorithm that has a lot more parameters, and occasionally on some data set they beat the Gibbs. Um, <laughs> the, I think one design philosophy that um, especially Holger Hoos has been trying to push is that you could just pick more complex methods, um, but then make sure that you have some sort of optimization technique that will optimize all your parameters. So you still, so you basically you increase the design space, but you make sure that you have a way, provided that you have a cost function and the resources that will allow you to tune your algorithm. And when you do that, you often do better. Um, so like in this example of trying to sample these toroidal Ising models, uh, Gibbs does quite poorly. Um, Swenson Mung is one of the best techniques for achieving this. But if we use a method that sort of has a bunch of heuristics which are tuned by Bayesian optimization, uh, we can very easily beat um, these very smart uh, algorithms. Um, 
I, th I think you saw this today. They also are important for things like A-B testing, um, especially like in the games industry where you each have a, a game that is slightly different in your phone. And, um, and these variations are sort of being tuned automatically to maximize the, the probability that you will pay 199 for an ax to go and kill some other bot. Um, so this is a very common uh, profitable business. Or in general, if you have a piece of software and you don't know exactly which one is the best, it's always good to do these A-B tests. Um, but if you do like them in a frequent setting, there's a beautiful actually blog by Steve Scott, uh, which shows you would require way too many tests. Um, but if you use bandits and a technique called Bayesian optimization, a Bayesian optimization technique called Thompson sampling that is about 100 years old, uh, you can actually do this quite efficiently. Um, another application that I liked was this, uh, this one that Eric came up with, where, like, imagine as an animator, you, you want um, you want to build something. So you might, for example, you want to build a dinosaur that walks like Emma Thompson. And it's very hard to come up with a mathematical formula of a dinosaur that works like Emma Thompson. Um, but you could have a dinosaur, two dinosaurs that sort of start walking. And you say, well, this one is closer to Emma Thompson. And by, by sort of zooming in just by choosing between the two. And the reason why we're doing choosing between the two is because paired comparisons are more reliable over time than, a, than, than the ratings. But by doing this, you eventually get to a dinosaur that works like Emma Thompson. So it's, it's this sort of interactive Bayesian optimization in design. Um, as, an, uh, as an example, he started with BRDFs, where in this case, we know what the target is um, in this experiment. Uh, and then he shows two things to a user. Um, and then the user picks the one that believes it's closer and does this over several stages. And eventually, the Bayesian optimization is basically learning the preference function. So here we have binary observations. The, the observations are no longer sort of continuous, but binary. But you've seen GPs for classification, so it is the same setup. So you, the output variable is binary. And then you're finding this latent GP function, which is the preference of a, a BRDF parameters. So this way, you automatically tune something. And he's also used this for like smoke simulation. So I think I have a, which allows you to sort of come up with very particular types of smoke. So you actually choose um, by, instead of tuning a bunch of parameters of Navier stock equations, uh, an animator will simply, through a design gallery, say which, uh, which of different smog simulations the animator prefers. <laughs> um, Frank Hatter and Kevin Leighton Brown and Holger Hoos, in particular, have also had a lot of success uh, especially with a technique called SMAC, it's a random forest based technique, um, have had a lot of success in being able to tune um, um, uh, mi mixed integer programming solvers like LP Solve and uh, what's the other big one? Uh, CPLEX. So, CPLEX is, I think, if you go under the hood, there's like over 100 free parameters. It works well, but you've got to tune those. Right, um, and the interface allows you to tune several of these, um, but the performance often depends on how well you tune those parameters. And so they've done a lot of work in tuning these. There's, they've also done a lot of work in tuning SAT solvers, and in fact, by doing this, they've won most of the SAT competitions in um, recent years. Um, this can be used in a um, sequential mechanism. You can. You know, you can apply this to very complex models where you might have some sequential tracking where you need to decide where to attend. And Bayesian optimization al also allows us to do these types of things. 
So very complex models um, can be applied, can be used with this. So re in reinforcement learning, we also <coughs> reinforcement learning can also be thought as very expensive cost functions. So essentially, you need to sort of plan very long term. And one way of doing this is what people call direct policy search, which essentially runs scenarios in your head as to what's going to happen if I do this and that and this and that and this. And you do multiple of these scenarios, and then you compute this uh, sort of a Monte Carlo estimate of the expected return that you will get if you were to follow a particular policy. Um, now, doing all these computations turn, uh, uh, is uh, notoriously expensive. So evaluating the expected return is very expensive. So uh, Bayesian optimization allows us to um, minimize the number of queries to the function, because it's trying to sort of, it will try to balance exploitation and exploration to, uh, to quickly find the optimum expected return. And so some students of mine have also used this for hierarchical uh, reinforcement learning. Where in this case, what we have is a taxi domain, uh, which is kind of like this. It's, this is Vancouver, Canada. Um, you have to pick a passenger somewhere. You have to plan the route to drop this passenger. And then you have to make sure that you follow the route and you stay on course. Um, if you go to Uber's web page, you'll find that Uber is hiring in Bayesian optimization. <laughs> I wonder whether they're using this stuff. I mean, Maybe. They haven't sent me a check. <laughs> um, but Peter Fraser, actually, who's also done a lot of work in Bayesian optimization, is working for them now, I believe. And they've hired a lot of other people. Um, so the, the student that, who did this for me is a gamer. And he was using this Torx engine. Um, at a low level, he was just trying to tune a neural network. So he was tuning all the parameters of this neural network, um, of which there were, I think, 15, using Bayesian optimization so that the car could learn to drive, to follow the path. Um, and here's an example of what it does. So at the high level, it has to decide whether to pick up the passenger, and then it has to drop it in the green uh, point. And the reason why it goes around what looks like a very <laughs> Actually, if you've been to Vancouver, this all makes sense, what it's doing. It's actually <laughs> super smart. Those are one-way streets. So you can't go those one-way streets. It goes around. It. Um, yeah, these are just some of the applications you could use this for. There's really um, a large number of applications of Bayesian optimization. And, um, and people are using this for all sorts of things. Um, OK, so I'm going to look at now, quickly go over uh, Bayesian optimization, um, and especially about the model and the acquisition functions that we use. I will argue that the most important thing is to think about the model, which is counter, which is counter what's the literature right now. I think most people are focusing on acquisition functions and not really giving clear thought about the statistical model. And I think at the end of the day, this is just statistics, and you need to really think about the model, and because um, that's what's going to determine performance more than anything. Um, that's my big message for you guys. Model, modeling matters. Um, in the parametric setting, we're going to use base rule. So parameters w, data d. Um, and so one of the simplest ways of thinking about Bayesian optimization is in the k-arm banded setting. Here, the idea is you have a bunch of machines that so will give you some return. Um, and when you come in and you, you want that return, you need to decide which machine to go for. And these machines are independent uh, in, the, in the traditional setup. Um, so you have k machines. Um, the return of each machine is a binary variable. So you try a machine, you get money, or you don't. And, and so your data after n trials is which machines you've tried. And you can try one more than once. And the returns, which are these uh, Bernoulli variables, zero, one. Um, and so 
each, to each machine, we're going to assign a parameter, which is the probability of actually getting money out of that machine. So that's the sort of Bernoulli parameter W. And there's one parameter per machine. So there's K of those Ws. And so what you're trying to optimize, the function you're trying to optimize, is pick the machine, i.e. the action is pick the bandit, uh, that will maximize, that will give you the highest expected return, the, the highest parameter W. So each machine has a W between 0 and 1. You're trying to figure out which one is the one that has the highest W, and that's the one that you play. So you're trying to find the optimal of a function where there is no continuity. Now this problem turns out to be really hard to do because it, there's no continuity. Um, and in fact, I um, can't remember who said this during the war, that um, what they should do is scribble the statement of this problem and drop it in Germany, because that would keep their scientists um, <laughs> too busy. OK, so we're going to go be basing about this, um, because we don't know the, those probabilities of each arm. And we're going to put a beta prior on each of them. So the beta prior is just the prior of our probabilities. That's the fine of a 0 and 1. Um, and depending on how we set the hyperparameters of the beta, we could get something that's more where the success probability is closer to 1, um, something where the success probability is closer to 0 or somewhat in the middle. Or we could get a uniform, in fact, for the beta 1, 1. Um, and this could be, um, I guess, in, these, in this A-B test, the, the three machines might be you're trying to decide which kind of uh, button you're going to put on your website to maximize uh, the money you make out of your customers. So we have this beta prior. Um, and then you make observations. So you count how many times you picked a particular arm A, and you got zero return and how many times you pick that arm and you got one return. So those counts are number of times that A gives me 0, number of times that action A um, gives me a 1. Um, that defines uh, basically a product of Bernoulli likelihood. And then if you multiply one times the other, um, it's uh, an introductory exercise in basic statistics to show that the posterior is um, also beta. Um, how many of you are familiar with Peter Bernoulli? Uh, OK. Um, so this for you guys are straightforward. If you're not familiar with it, look at one of my lectures, Introduction to Machine Learning in YouTube, um, Peter Bernoulli uh, models or graphical models. Um, but it's very much like what you do with a Gaussian process. You multiply the prior times the likelihood, and you just normalize so that the posterior is normalized. Everything is analytical, so we're able to analytically derive the posterior. Yeah, my question, when you place uh, any of the machines, does the Bernoulli distribution change after? No. Uh, the, so we're, we're assuming we're in a static setting. Each machine has a success probability. And my task is to find a machine that has the highest success probability. Yeah, the machine is not changing. That's a, that's a more complex problem, the dynamic bandit problem. So, and, and in fact, there's setups, I think they're called restless bandits. And, um, um, so there are setups in which the bandits do change over time. So you could think of your, it might be the, your, your customers are also changing. And you might want to pick the right. Your demographics, for example, is changing. And you need to pick the right buttons. Um, so one of the simplest solutions for this, and this is one of my favorite Bayesian optimization strategies, because you can do it with almost everything, with any statistical model, is at each iteration, we draw a sample from this beta posterior, which you can do, is tractable. Um, and then you pick the action with highest return, with the highest w, so the arm of the highest w. Um, so in other words, we draw a sample. You have a posterior of a the probability of each arm. That's your estimate based on the observations that you have. And if you have an estimate of how much each arm is, va what's the value of each arm, um, then you just then find the arm that has, you find the best arm uh, according to your posterior. 
So in going back to what you saw this morning, um, if I was doing a GP and I have, let's say, some, something like this, and I have some mean function. This is done over a bounded set. I have some confidence intervals. I don't know what the true function is, but I have this fit um, to the function f of a, and, my, and I have to choose an action. So for a GP, you can in fact think of a GP as many bandits, if infinitely many bandits. Um, and what you're doing is you're pulling one of these arms, but you also have continuity. So these bandits are all correlated. It turns out that the correlation is something that theoreticians sort of kind of run away from, or I think a lot of practitioners run away from, because it seems correlation just makes it so much more complex. It turns out that in practice is what saves us and what allows us to solve this problem. Because when you pull an arm, you learn about all the neighboring arms. That's the idea of you exploit that to get a way more information than if, if the arms are independent. Um, and so what the Thompson sampling strategy will do um, is we're going to draw a sample from this GP. Whoops. There's a bug in this GP. You draw a sample, so something in between here. I don't know, something where high probability will be within those confidence intervals. Um, and then you pick the maximum of the sample. Actually, let me draw it a bit like this. So in this case, the maximum of the sample. So essentially what you're doing is you're drawing a sample from the posterior. That's this operation here. And then given that sample of the posterior, you pick the maximum. OK, and so that's the A star that you choose. Let me make that dark. Okay. And you can think in this case, W is really this whole is this whole function, the blue function. And then you pick the maximum of the many, w, the many Ws. Um, and so that's Thompson sampling. Um, it's very simple because, I mean, and intuitive, because basically this function will oscillate more where there's high variance and will tend to go over also where you did the best. So in areas where there's high variance and high, high, and high mean, if you're trying to maximize the function, that's where you're likely to pick a candidate. So it satisfies um, the, it sort of does similar things to UCB and expected improvement. Uh, Neil, what time do, uh, we started at 11.10. 12.10? Yeah. 12.10, well hungry. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Let's skip lunch. <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll, uh, I have tomorrow as well. So, and not enough slides for tomorrow's talk. So, I'm, I'm happy to make this slow. <laughs> Ask questions. <laughs> okay, sweet. Um, so the algorithm then in the binary in the in the multiple arms case where these arms give you a reward that it's binary. It's pretty much like this. Initially, all the counts are zero. Um, you draw a sample from the posterior. Um, you pick the highest w. Uh, to each to each a there is sort of a, a w of a. Um, you observe the reward by pulling the action of the arm with the highest reward. So once I choose this, I might get an observation. Here, well, that's unlikely, but that's with a lot of noise say here. And then I re-update my counts 
and, re uh, and that will allow me to re-update my posterior. So here, I would just recompute the mean and the covariance of the GP. Okay, so it's again, you sample a point, you update the statistics of the model, and move on to do the next thing. The nice thing, as you're probably observing, is that the, the scheme of doing Thompson sampling just requires that you construct a posterior distribution and can sample from it. So we did it for the beta Bernoulli. We've done it here. And you probably guessed it right. You could do this for logistic regression. You could do this with Bayesian neural nets. You could do this with anything. Um, the only problem is that computing a, a Bayesian posterior is sometimes expensive. So the sampling mechanism could be computationally expensive. Uh, people are also now very recently trying frequentist techniques to do this. Uh, one that I really like, there's a couple of papers in archive doing this using uh, the bootstrap method, which is sort of a cheap uh, base way of uh, getting confidence intervals. Um, so th those papers are really interesting. One's by Ian Osband at uh, Stanford. Um, it's very cool. Um, and can be extended nicely to the sequential case as they do in, uh, in their paper. So um, the next thing though, like if we go into sort of a simple Bayesian statistics progression, is linear regression, linear models. And so with linear models, we can also do Bayesian optimization. Our GP is sort of a linear model, in fact, of, in, given the features. Um, um, here we're going to assume that we have an input, and we're going to assume that we have a vector of inputs for each action. Why does it make sense, say, to a company like Google? It's because you, you might want to choose, you might want to launch a page, and there's 10 features that you need to decide whether you should include them in the page or not. Um, so you have 10 variables that could be, uh, maybe we put a cyan thing here, or maybe it should be blue. Um, this border line should be pink or red. Um, this line should be here or not. Um, and so if you have 10, say, choices that you need to make, 10 binary choices, you now need to do two to the 10 tests. So your actions grow very quickly if you were to use the beta Bernoulli model. Uh, that wouldn't be tractable. But what you can do is you can take vectors of 10, of, so with 10 uh, variables, 10 binary variables, and you can look at what's the value of this vector, especially if you assume that these guys are correlated. So we introduce um, so we introduce correlation via a parameter w. And then you have all your observations, um, x1, x2, and so on. Um, so the linear model, basically, it's through the w's that these axes become correlated. And because these arms become correlated, we can now just basically, maybe we just want to test the combination uh, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, and the combination 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and this would allow us to test those combinations. So we can do combinatorial things much more efficiently. Um, the mechanics is always the same, and it's the mechanics of Bayesian statistics. We specify a prior. In this case, we can actually be analytical, so we can specify a Gaussian prior for W, and this is assumed to be in Gaussian noise with variance sigma squared. And so we specify an inverse gamma prior for sigma squared. Um, and when you do Bayesian stats, you also learn to do by hand this calculation that gives you the mean and the variance of the posterior, which is also Gaussian. Uh, Kevin Murphy's book on this is very good. Um, uh, Chris Bishop's, oh, I don't know if he covers this. I'm sure he does. Um, but once you have this analytical expression for this, the mechanics of how you do it, don't worry about it. If this looks like just too much blacking for you to you right now, um, you can always go to a book. And if you spend a week, you learn to derive these guys. Um, and so once you have a sum, so the way we implement Thompson is exactly the same as here or as before for the beta Bernoulli, which is you draw a sample from the posterior of these parameters of the model, and then you just maximize the expected return. 
the mean being just the line. Um, just finding them, when you have a line going through points, finding the maximum is not very interesting by itself, but it's you, instead of having just, you can put the axis through nonlinear functions, through features, and then it becomes interesting. Because even though, so if you have features, like for example, in your x squared or um, as we'll see, some uh, um, RBFs or sinusoids, um, then the model is still linear in W. So you can again compute a posterior of W from which you can sample W and you can uh, do Bayesian optimization. And note here that I'm no longer picking particular actions A. So I'm no longer in the banded setting when I'm, I have a discrete set of actions. But if once I have features like this expression here, I can actually optimize directly over the whole X space. Um, and so this is exactly the setup here with Gaussian processes, except that we're doing it with, uh, in the parametric setting so far. Um, and yeah, you can take your favorite, if you like deep learning, you can take your, your favorite deep net, uh, recurrent net, or a convolutional net, and you can use it to generate the features if it's pre-trained on some task. Um, and then what you have to do is just compute a posterior over this. Um, in fact, Ryan Adams, Jasper Snook, and um, the, us the usual gang recently um, had a paper where they were doing exactly that. And then they were estimating the parameters of these guys by uh, maximum likelihood type 2. So basically, they do, they're Bayesian in the output layer. Um, and then they just do maximum likelihood for this, which is exactly what we do with GPs. We, uh, we do maximum likelihood for the covariance, provided we have enough data. Um, if you use quadratic features, for example, you still get the sort of things that you like about that we like about GPs. That near the data in a Bayesian setting, um, if you have some likelihood and some parametric prior and you integrate the parameters, the predictive distribution still has the property that the variance increases away from the data, and where there is data, we know the confidence. Uh, so it's the same as what we get here. Provided we do it well. So, so some, there's some parametric schemes out there that do approximations and break this. Um, but if you can do anything analytically with a, G, with a neur for example, maximum likelihood type 2 with a neural network where you only do base in over the output layer, you can achieve this. Um, the MLE, the frequentist way of doing things, on the other hand, is very bad because it will do this. But as I mentioned, you can use other frequentist techniques like the bootstrap, which is a really cheap way of computing confidence intervals, um, and an excellent way too, that would allow you to get something that's closer to this. Um, so that's based on optimization. And, and what I hope I sort of have sort of conveyed in the, uh, is that you, there's many, you could use any Bayesian model and different problems will require a different type of model. Um, and um, even though Gaussian process, the thing that's been used a lot with Bayesian optimization, and will continue being one of the most important things that, uh, that we do with Bayesian optimization, there's many other ways to think about the problem. And, and by thinking that way, we can see the connection to bandits and experimental design and all these other areas. Um, You've probably seen GPs ad nauseum, so I'm going to go very quickly. So um, this is not my favorite way of deriving GPs, but given the chain of slides is the one that makes sense. You can start with the parametric model. And if you integrate out the parameters, uh, one thing that you realize is that the, the, like, uh, the probability of the data um, involves dot products of your features, of your axes. Um, or if you use mappings phi of x, once again, it involves dot products. Um, the plus sigma squared is because we're going from the mean to y by adding Gaussian noise. Um, and so folks many years ago realized that there's these algorithms where the features always appear as, dot, as inner products. And so you can replace an inner product with a kernel. 
And if we do that, instead of thinking in terms of features, you think in terms of kernels, in terms of the relation of one feature to the other. And so quite often it's nicer in some problem settings to think of how to specify a kernel um, than it is to specify features. Um, but there are problems where I think it's the other way around. So this is kind of a matter of taste and a problem at hand. Um, if we have these distributions for, say, test date and train data given the axis, they'll be the same distribution, except this one has more elements in the vector y. Then we can also compute the conditional probabilities. Um, and so if we start with a GP, those conditional probabilities are the two equations that you've been seeing so far. So a GP is still just this linear model, but where we're using phi's, and because everything appears as dot products, we replace the dot product of phi's by a kernel. And you've seen samples of a GP by now, I'm assuming lots, the prior samples from the posterior, so the data sort of seizes the samples. Um, and there's different types of kernels you could use. Um, I often find the squared exponential to be too smooth. Um, sometimes I think there's, for Bayesian optimization, it's probably more advisable to, to use a matern kernel in continuous setups. And then the parameters are estimated by, in the, the case of the GP, the hyperparameters of the kernel estimated by maximum likelihood. Um, now, that is true for GPs in general where you have a lot of data. When you do Bayesian optimization and you only have a few points, doing this is madness um, because you're just going to be overfitting. You're going to get caught in traps because you don't have enough data to inform um, the choice of parameters. And by being Bayesian about it and doing, putting a prior of the hyperparameters, uh, you mitigate the problem, but even then, you can also get yourself into trouble. Um, finally, uh, another technique that's been very successful for Bayesian optimization is to use. Um, you're standing because I have yeah, to stop. I'm just start, start. Okay. <laughs> 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 another technique that's very useful is uh, trees, and I'm just sort of giving a very high level now of what people do. Um, and so when you do trees. Um, you, the idea is if you have a function like this, you could fit two linear models um, and you could get a pretty nice fit. Um, so you sort of branch out on the tree um, and as you branch, you essentially pick, um, you make these decisions. If you're working on a function that has say 20, you're trying to tune 20 parameters, you, um, at each node of the tree, you pick a subset of the parameters and then you compute a threshold and depending on, say, the first parameter is greater than five or less than five, you branch out into one of these. And what you essentially going to be doing is a piecewise fit. So we could do Bayesian fits in each of the branches. So like in this case, in leaf one, leaf two, we could do two, um, two Bayesian fits. Um, the typical thing that folks do is to sort of, because of computation, um, is to do this type of fit. But you could, you know, very easily end up with these very cool fits. And tomorrow I'm going to talk a bit more about solutions on how we do um, things with trees. An advantage of trees that is really important is that um, as you, um, because the, as you construct a tree, you, sub, you subsample a set of parameters and you, or you choose among a subset of the parameters that you need to optimize, you're automatically handling the problem of high dimensions. If you have, say, 200 variables, but only 10 variables are really important to performance, the trees will tend to pick those 10 variables. And so it's one way of attacking high dimensions. Um, and in fact, Frank Harter, when he tunes a lot of his things, he uses like 200. He, he typically works in hundreds of dimensions. Is there a way to learn where the separation occurs between the two, uh, two models? Uh, this, yeah. yeah, that's what you learn. You learn the, so in a tree you need to learn uh, out of say the 100, uh, feature, 100 things you're optimizing, which ones are the ones that are gonna be more useful to split. And you also have to learn where to put the split. Um, and then one of the problems that also arises is I use, as you're splitting, like you could put fit GPs on the leaves of the, 
of the tree. So you could do this piecewise GP fitting. Um, and tomorrow I'm going to talk about that a bit. Um, the thing you need to worry about is as, as we already have very little data. So if we start partitioning the space, each partition will have even less data. And so we're going to have to come up with some sort of hierarchical way of sort of using information from the other points to decide how to choose the hyperparameters in each division. Um, but trees are awesome. Trees with um, trees are also, this is, by the way, these are slides from the book of Antonio Cremonese and Random Forest, which I certainly recommend. Trees also capture the sort of, when you have a, a data set that looks like this, two lines, um, the type of estimates that you get, it's sort of hard to see in this picture, but you get to some sort of bimodality in your distribution, which is very nice. It's capturing some information that just the unimodal doesn't quite <coughs> give you. And to wrap up <laughs> in one minute, um, you've probably heard a lot about acquisition functions this morning. Um, so I'll very quickly tell you that there's many of them, PI, EI, UCB. You've seen them, so I'm not going to go over them. There's Thompson sampling. Um, there's entropy search, which you will hear about ad nauseum tomorrow. Um, in practice, all of these acquisition functions work about the same. <laughs> and we, and like sometimes one fails, one does better. And one of the things you could do is use portfolios of them. But by and large, I think the focus in the literature is how to design a better acquisition function that is the right way of doing Bayesian optimization. And somehow, everything else is always a heuristic. Um, but um, you know, I encourage you to look at do comparisons between these and look at the results. Because certainly, there's a lot of evidence saying that this is not what matters. What matters is that you do your Bayesian take a base course in Bayesian statistics and learn to derive the posteriors carefully, and then learn to deal with all these things that I haven't talked about that we'll go over tomorrow, like non-stationarity, conditional parameters, um, multitask, high dimensions, and so on. So all these statistical decisions um, do, will have high influence on, uh, in applications, more so than this choice of acquisition function. Great. Thank you. Um,